Hey, I'm in Damascus, the capital of Syria. Usually on my channel, I obsess about the shiniest, newest technologies. But this video is different. Since I'm here to visit family friends, I asked them to show me what the city looks like today. 14 years of civil war, authoritarianism and sanctions have slowly destroyed this once beautiful country and the damage is visible everywhere. But while change is painfully slow, at least some people are now also cautiously optimistic for a fresh new start. I'm a tech YouTuber, so I focused on filming what I know best. I dove deep into the solar boom of the country, I explored the revived airport and also the central train station that was dormant for a decade and is now being restarted, I talked to entrepreneurs building businesses and more, and I asked people every question I could to get a good picture of where things stand. It's a bit of a different video, but I hope you enjoy watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. Perhaps the easiest way to arrive to Syria is to fly directly to Damascus International Airport, which has reopened after the new government took over. Under the previous regime, the only connections were to Russia, Iran and Egypt, and this beautiful facade was covered with giant photos of Bashar al-Assad. The portraits are gone now, and while the section of flights is still pretty limited, they have definitely expanded. There are a few local carriers, plus we also saw a Turkish airline flight overhead, which serves the airport, and Qatar Airlines also has a connection, so it's much easier to fly here directly now. Both Turkey and Qatar have announced support for rebuilding the airport, and we also snuck into the upper floors where you could see reminders of a past where before the war, Etihad, Emirates, and many other airlines used to serve the airport as well. These have not come back yet, and for now the traffic is pretty limited, but the current state is a definite improvement compared to what was here just a year ago. Now, another thing the country is reviving is its rail system. Syria had a functioning network before too, but that was completely shut down once the civil war broke out, and parts of it were given up on even before that. The new government recently announced that they're going to restart service in the country, and so I convinced my friends to try to get a look at what's left of the system. We somehow managed to sweet talk our way into being able to film in the Damascus station, and we got a pretty good look at what's left there today. This is the main building where you'd buy tickets and stuff, then there's also this waiting hole with chairs that even has an AC unit plus cute little train miniatures in it, and then you have a few tracks with a pedestrian bridge on top plus two trains. Well, technically there are more trains off to the side as well, but those look so hopelessly rusted out that I doubt anything will happen to those again. The news reports that I've seen show that there's at least one other train that is operational and has a diesel locomotive that they claim has made a test drive on the track between Damascus and Aleppo, and this seems to be in a halfway decent shape, but it wasn't actually at the station when I visited. What I got to see were some tracks that were in pretty obvious need of maintenance, though at least they were still there I guess, and then these two trains which ranged from kind of broken to mostly okay I guess. Over a decade of disuse has clearly not been kind to them and I obviously can't say much about their technical details, but they look like something that could technically be patched up again along with the rest of the stations as well. Given that most of Syria's population lives along a single north to south corridor which already has a rail line going along it, I think it's not too unreasonable to think that restarting this might even make economic sense. We'll see how that goes. In other parts of the city you can see rail lines that the previous government abandoned even before the civil war broke out, but for these there has been no talk of restarting them just yet, as far as I can tell. And meanwhile last on my railway exploration was checking out this gem of a building from the heyday of rail travel. It's the old central train station in the city center of Damascus and the historic locomotive on the outside, as well as the beautiful interior, all remind the onlookers of a more peaceful, more prosperous and more internationally connected past which was wiped away by long years of war and authoritarian rule before it. Sadly today, this is mostly just a museum building as it hasn't seen actual trains in a very long time. Out in the back you can see where the train tracks used to be, but they're all gone by now. Interestingly, the new government has announced that they'll build Damascus's first metro line with a station right here, though construction hasn't actually started yet and most people I've talked to weren't fully convinced that it ever will. The government of Qatar claims that they want to invest to make it happen, but we'll see how that goes. In general, the Gulf states and Turkey especially claim that they want to build loads of stuff in the country now that the government has changed, but it's too early to say how far those promises will go. And then, moving on from trains, let's talk about cars. We actually arrived to Syria by car from Lebanon and the most memorable thing I saw entering the country was what appeared to be a 12 year old boy who pretty confidently drove an ancient Mercedes across the border full of police and military personnel. The new government fired all the former police and military and hasn't gotten around to hiring enough new ones yet, so traffic rules in general are pretty lightly enforced. The roads themselves are also in a pretty poor condition and 
and so are most of the cars on them across the country. It's very common to see some pretty Mad Max looking cars from the 80s and 90s including this rather cool Mazda that one of our friends drove around us in, but also loads of old Lada cars which are a reminder of the previous regime being friends with the Soviets and then the Russians. These old clunkers are so common in part because under the previous regime one had to pay massive import taxes on cars. I've heard anything from 100 to 400 percent of the value of the car from various people and combined with general poverty and crazy inflation, people could often only afford the absolute cheapest stuff. As a result, they frequently imported beaten up cars and fixed them up themselves. This is in part because they often can't afford anything else, but also because the conditions in Damascus are so rough on cars that buying anything other than a beaten up model almost feels like a waste. Among other things, the roads are so broken in places that they hit car floors all the time, while it's also still hard to get fuel that is of decent quality. The gas stations carry really poor quality fuel, while a black market has popped up for imported fuel for places like Lebanon. This is typically slightly more expensive fuel than what you'd get at the gas station, though supposedly it is of better quality. However, as you can imagine, if fuel from random, unlicensed plastic bottles is considered good, then nothing really is good. Meanwhile, the new government also dropped import taxes on most things, including cars dramatically, which kickstarted a massive new wave of imports. As a result, there are now a bunch of newer and sometimes even fairly fancy cars on the streets, as these have become significantly more affordable. But the huge wave of imports also means that the streets are now even more insane clogged than they were before, and traffic is about as bad as I've seen anywhere in the world. Cars are often double, triple, or even quadruple parked, lanes do not really exist, and it's basically all chaos. And combined with the low quality fuel plus poorly maintained engines, the city is also covered in some of the worst fumes I've ever encountered. There are talks of the government trying to rein this traffic situation in somehow, and as we know, the only way to fix traffic is to offer good alternatives to driving, so let's talk about public transportation next. In Damascus, for now, this mainly means buses, of which there are two types. First, there are these minibuses, of which there are thousands across the city. They're pretty beaten up and I guess they aren't technically public because they're operated by private owners. But anyway, the government assigns routes to them, they function as buses, and people hop on and off as you would expect. I found it cute that one can buy things like bread along the way by just telling the driver to stop next to a street seller. And these buses often don't actually have official numbers, the driver simply signals with his hands if they're going, for example, to the city center. Meanwhile, there's also a network of regular city buses in much better condition. These apparently used to be run by the government itself, but they were sold off to a private business. The buses themselves are typically from China and they're in a pretty good condition, plus they also have proper route numbers as well, but they're much less common than the minibuses. Of course, there's no bus lane, so you're stuck in the same insane traffic as all the cars, and in general, this network, I think, needs a lot of work. Now, talking of things that need a lot of work, let's talk about electricity in Damascus. Or rather, the lack thereof. At times, you can see whole parts of the city that are dark and off-grid. That is because the central grid in Damascus comes online for about one hour in any given district, and then it is off again for another five hours or so. Then it is on again for one hour, and off again for five, etc. The power cycles through the various districts, so only a part of the city is online at any given time, and this is done because the central grid can't generate enough power to support all of them simultaneously. Over the last decade or so, the power plants have decayed, the central government didn't have control over the country's gas fields, which were often held by opposition forces, plus they also had a hard time importing gas, so the grid slowly fell apart. The new government claims that they're rebuilding the grid with the help of Turkey, but here too progress has been slow. So as a result, people have turned very clearly to solar power and batteries instead. Every square inch on the roofs of both private homes and commercial spaces is covered in solar panels, and while reliable statistics are impossible to come by, I'd be surprised if Syria didn't have somewhere close to the highest concentration of residential solar installations in the whole world. There was a solar installation on each mosque I saw. There was one on the abandoned train station. I saw them next to random shacks in the middle of the desert, and I've even heard of farmers carrying solar panels out with them to their fields during the day. Essentially, everyone who can afford them has solar panels. All of these installations are off-grid, of course, meaning that they power something like a home directly without being connected to the central grid. To do this, people of course have inverters and relays, plus also batteries of all types at home. There are big ones that power a bunch of appliances at once, and also small additional batteries here and there, all of which get charged by the solar panels. All of these batteries typically have enough juice to power smaller appliances, but the high consumption ones like hair dryers, for example, are typically only used when the grid is on, and the households have also equipped themselves with low power LED strips and other devices so as to minimize power consumption when on battery. I talked with a shop owner who sells panels and he claims that their prices fell dramatically once the government changed, as just like with cars, they suddenly lowered 
import taxes dramatically. One of these 550 watt panels used to cost 130 USD before the regime change, while after the change the prices have now dropped to about $70. That means they're really quite affordable now. Of course, the panels are mostly from China, with Jinko and Longi being the two biggest suppliers, and most inverters and batteries are from China as well. Some commercial spaces still use diesel generators as well, but with each year, solar plus batteries seem to be replacing these as they're just cheaper to run by now. Okay, and moving on from electricity, one more thing I wanted to show you was what running a business looked like in Syria. I was invited to the offices of a friend's company named Mr. Print to look at their operations and chat with their teams. They started out by providing custom embroidery for things like graduation clothes, and the team told me that the change of government made things a lot easier, and that has allowed them to expand since. Import duties have also also dropped dramatically on things like machinery since the government changed and this allowed them to import their first ever UV printing machine from China to start a new business line. UV printing is a special kind of printing process that can create waterproof labels and stuff on top of irregular surfaces. Meanwhile, the team was also allowed to develop and publish its own app where customers could fine tune and place their order. This was previously forever stuck in government review processes because the previous government somehow felt the need to review and deny app launches for something as unthreatening as a printing app. Anyway, the team UV printed some stickers off my logo, and I also saw them do some embroidery firsthand as well. Very impressive stuff. And in general, I found their optimism for the future and their excitement about new possibilities very encouraging. Now, sadly, a few obvious roadblocks still remain until today. For example, while the US, the EU and others have all announced in one way or another that they plan to lift sanctions on the country, today many sanctions are still in place. Among others, the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store still cannot be accessed without a VPN, and Syrians can't officially get a developer account either, so they typically have to go through some intermediary abroad. This makes both publishing and downloading apps extra annoying. And by the way, a ton of international services like Notion, Slack, etc. refuse to work in the country as well. These are typically not things that the Syrian government blocks, but rather the foreign firms following, for example, US rules to make sure that they don't do any business in a sanctioned country, and they're still present today. And meanwhile, another pain point is digital payments. Since none of the usual international payment processors are present, most people don't pay online or with cards at all, and the whole economy is mostly cash-based. Given the insane inflation under the previous regime, that can look pretty crazy at times, and it's very common for people to carry literal bags worth of cash with them. Now recently MTN, one of the big mobile carriers of Syria, launched the country's first big mobile wallet called Cash Mobile, and while this has been gaining popularity, it's still new and far from universal. And while there are apps for doing things like ordering a taxi similar to Uber or ordering food similar to DoorDash, the customers usually still pay with cash at the end. Many people I've talked to said that the lifting of sanctions would now be the most important step for the country's recovery, given that the government has already dramatically lowered its crippling import taxes and has simplified unnecessarily complex approval processes. Now make no mistake, this recovery will not be easy or fast. I've seen firsthand whole districts hollowed out by bombs and others bombed so heavily that there was nothing left of them except rubble as far as the eye could see. Even in houses and areas that are relatively untouched by the war, I found holes left by straight bullets. There is just so much to rebuild and sadly many unresolved conflicts remain, with ethnic tensions continuing to flare up in ugly ways. But having seen Damascus both before and after the fall of the Assad regime, I'm hopeful that better times may come for Syria still. I found Syrians to be incredibly welcoming and kind and I hope I can visit again soon. This video does not have a sponsor because telling you to buy a VPN or something after showing your country in such a difficult position just didn't feel right. That said, if you want to support my work, you can do so either on Patreon or on Nebula. I've left links to both of them down in the description. Uh, just as a heads up, I don't actually upload anything to Patreon. So if you want to get any exclusive content, you only do that on uh, Nebula. But yeah, either works. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it and I'll see you in the next one.